and I'm trying to advance my screen here, and for some reason it's not working. Uh, let's see what I need to do. This was working fine yesterday. Uh, well, let's see here. Any suggestions that people have for how to get this moving? Do the did the arrows on the your keyboard work? Let's, let's see. Uh, let's try this. Ah, there we go. Okay. I guess the keyboard didn't work, but the ones on screen do. All right. So, uh, mushrooms are actually the fruit of these organisms that we call fungi. Uh, they are certainly not the entire organism. In fact, it's just like an apple on a tree is not uh, the entire apple tree. Uh, what you see when you pick a mushroom is just the fruit of an organism, most of which is underground. Because fungi are actually composed of microscopic filaments that are matted together and they form these underground mass called mycelia. That's what the mushroom growers call spawn. And the ones that produce large fruiting bodies, those are what we call mushrooms. Now there certainly are fungi that don't produce such fruiting bodies. And the most familiar ones would be yeast, uh, mold, and these uh, parasites of uh, cereal grains, for example, called rust. And then there's also a combination organism that we call lichens, because some fungi combine with algae to form these dual organisms. I'm not going to be saying more about lichens tonight, but just to clarify their relationship. Now, surprisingly, fungi are more closely related to us than they are to plants, even though for years they were regarded as lower plants, uh, they're now recognized as a separate kingdom of organisms. Uh, like us, they are not capable of making their own food. They can't perform photosynthesis. So they are dependent upon other organisms for their nutrition. Of course, they're very different from us in many other respects in terms of their uh, cellular structure. Uh, they cannot move around like we can. And uh, their digestion is basically outside their body. They exude enzymes into the soil, and these uh, enzymes basically digest nutrients that are there, and then the fungi reabsorb. So they're quite different from both plants and animals. But the fact that they are more closely related to us does have one important consequence, which is that when you get a fungal disease, they're hard to get rid of. And the reason is basically that drugs that will kill fungi uh, are very likely to be toxic to us as well. So there's only a certain number of uh, drugs that are effective. Okay, so in the forest, there's Three important roles that fungi serve. Perhaps the most familiar ones are the decomposers or saprophytes, which basically are nature's recyclers. Uh, without them, the, the leaves and branches would just continue to pile up uh, and we'd be suffocated by all of this. And in particular, uh, fungi are really neat in that they can digest both cellulose and lignin. Lignin is the brown structural material in trees. You might uh, consider that there was a period in Earth's history, uh, the Carboniferous era, when uh, trees did not decay and were basically eventually compacted and uh, formed coal beds, which of course are important, or were important at least, to Pennsylvania's economy. But uh, then fungi develop the ability to digest with them, and so we no longer have full fun. The second group are pathogens, that is, parasites on either plants, animals, or 
sometimes even other fungi. Less familiar, perhaps, are what are called mycorrhizal relationships. Uh, these are mutually beneficial partnerships between mushrooms and trees. And mycorrhizal just means uh, a fungus root. Uh, what happens is that the uh, microscopic filaments that are the fungi uh, surround or in some cases penetrate the roots of the trees and they exchange nutrients with the tree. Each gives the other something they need. And without them, most of our forest trees would be severely stunted. Uh, they're also important for the growth of some orchids. So mycorrhizal relationships turn out to be very, very important indeed. And of course, uh, there are some fungi that are important food sources for woodland animals. Uh, the most well-known are truffles, which are totally underground, but they have very strong odors, and uh, animals that burrow into the ground, such as voles, uh, will find them through the odor and feed on them, and then the spores that are the reproductive elements of fungi pass through the digestive system of the animal, and that's how the truffles reproduce. So fungi are very important to us in many ways. Uh, certainly, they're responsible for fermentation, and so necessary to make bread, wine, beer, and different cheeses. But as we all know, they also cause food spoilage. Some fungi are delicious edibles, but others are deadly poisonous. And one of the big problems, of course, is learning to identify mushrooms so you can tell which is which. Some fungi, such as the rust, are serious agricultural pathogens. There are fungi, such as those that cause athlete's foot, that, that cause human diseases, and there are rare but uh, very serious uh, human diseases that are caused by fungi as well. They are also, however, the source of important medicine. The best known, of course, is penicillin, but cyclosporin, the drug used to reject or I'm sorry, to prevent rejection in organ transplants, is also derived from a fungus. And finally, of course, here in Pennsylvania, the commercial mushroom industry is very important to our economy. Uh, something like 60% of all the commercial mushrooms sold in stores across the United States are grown here in Pennsylvania, many of them down in the Kenneth Square area near Philadelphia. Now, recently it's been discovered that uh, because they're so good at recycling things, uh, they can be used to recycle waste. And some fungi have actually developed the ability to digest plastic, which given our plastic pollution problem is a really promising development. Uh, there are companies now that are starting to make uh, products out of fungal mycelium. Uh, to take advantage of these uh, decomposition properties. Of course, some mushrooms are simply very beautiful. They're, they're very colorful. Uh, they add to our woodlands. And there are even some of them that glow in the dark. And finally, I'll mention that some mushrooms uh, have been found to uh, yield dyes. And the mushroom dyes are more color fast than any other natural dye. And they're also much easier to uh, use than uh, ones obtained from plants. Here's an example uh, from uh, my wife's stock of yarn. All of the yarn you see in this picture, uh, she dyed using mushrooms. So you can see you get a full palette of colors. Uh, the mushrooms themselves often are very colorless, but depending on what the mordant you use, you can really get a, a very large variety of colors. So let's uh, consider some commonly asked questions. First, how many mushroom species are there in Pennsylvania? Well, you may be surprised. We don't know for sure, but of the ones that have been identified, there are about 8,000. And that's thought to be the tip of the iceberg, about 10% of what are really out there. 
So worldwide, the number of fungal species is amazing. They're very, very diverse and common organisms. Are any mushrooms poisonous to touch? Well, not in the USA, fortunately. However, there is one in Japan and now found in Australia as well that is said to be. And uh, it's also uh, quite toxic to eat as well. How dangerous is it to eat wild mushrooms? Well, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be very dangerous. But that's not specific to mushrooms, because if you eat anything from the wild that you're not positively identified, uh, you stand a good chance of poisoning yourself. And mushrooms are really no more dangerous in that regard than plants are, except that, unlike plant toxins, but the toxins in the most deadly mushroom species don't produce any symptoms until 24 hours or longer, by which time it's too late to uh, punch your stomach. The toxin is already in your system, and if you don't get a very prompt treatment, you, if you survive, you may well end up on uh, kidney dialysis for the rest of your life with the damage to your liver as well. So uh, certainly the most dangerous mushrooms are very dangerous indeed, and it's important to know how to identify them. Is there any simple test for edibility? And alas, the answer is no. And the idea that there is such a test is a really dangerous fallacy. The only way you can tell whether a mushroom is edible or poisonous is to spend a lot of time learning about mushrooms learning the identification characteristics and probably spending quite a bit of time with uh, field guides uh, taking what are called spore prints which means you, you take the cap of a mushroom and you lay it with the, uh, the spore producing side down on a piece of white paper you leave it for a little while and you come back and you will see a pattern uh, left by the spores on the piece of paper and the very first thing to do in identifying a mushroom is to note the color of the spore print. Because although the mushrooms themselves will change in color as they age, and maybe with weather conditions, the color of the spores is constant. Okay, so let me mention that uh, one thing that's different about mushrooms compared to other plants and animals very few of them have common names. Uh, some do, but they may have more than one common name, or different names in different parts of the country, or among different ethnic groups. So if you do engage in serious study or identification of mushrooms, you're going to have to make a peace with Latin names. And Latin names, like people, are made up of a first name and a last name. The first name is a generic name, and the Second name is the species or specific epithet. And you can tell which are which because for those who do have common names, those are usually uh, in Roman type and scientific names are in italic type. And I will follow that in this presentation as well. So uh, let me start by talking about three deadly species we have here in Pennsylvania. Uh, the most common and uh, the worst is known as the destroying angel. That's its common name. The scientific name is Amanita bisporigera. It's a beautiful woodland mushroom, very common in the late summer and uh, early fall. Uh, it's large, it's pure white, and it has some important identifying characteristics. Uh, one of them is the uh, fat at the base of the stalk that surrounds it and sort of clasps it. Uh, the second characteristic is the skirt that hangs from the stalk. You can see both of those in this photograph. Uh, it has white spores, which you can see if you take a, a spore print. Uh, and also the, uh, the spores are born on these structures we call gills, and they are also white. And they're not attached to the stalk. There is a sort of a, a, a clear space, a, a moat, if you will, 
that surrounds the top of the stalk and separates it from the gill. And all of those are critical characteristics that pretty well identify the destroying agent. Uh, another one in the same genus, Amanita, uh, that was originally the European species, but recently has come to this country as well, is Amanita phylloides. Uh, it's greenish, uh, and it's really just as deadly as the other one, but not nearly as often found here. And the third one, we use this background in the uh, title slide uh, for this presentation that we saw earlier. Uh, this is a small mushroom. It's rather inconspicuous, and that's good because it isn't often picked by people. Uh, but it turns out to be a deadly lookalike for an edible mushroom, uh, and in fact, a mushroom that's even uh, sold sometimes in stores. Uh, so this is a small brown mushroom. It has a brown spore print, and critically, it has that ring that you see on the stalk. The edible species that looks a lot like it has a sort of a velvety stalk and does not have a ring. So when we take our club members out and we find this mushroom, we often find the other one as well, and we make sure that everyone in our club knows this mushroom. In general, there are a lot of small brown mushrooms, and we recommend that people just leave them alone because there's so many of them, and they are so hard to distinguish. That uh, it's frustrating from an identification standpoint, and it can be dangerous if you uh, start to eat one of them. So, in turning to a little happier topic, uh, let's look at some of the fungal decomposers we have here in Pennsylvania. One of the most common are what are called turkey tails, for obvious reasons. Uh, they have these lovely uh, rosettes, and the, they're very colorful, especially when they're wet, and they persist for years. <laughs> so they're woody, they tend to grow all over fallen logs, and they are gradually digesting those logs. Uh, and the underside, if you look at them, does not have gills, but rather pores. So they belong to a group of mushrooms that are known as polypores. There are also false turkey tails that also grow on wood and are also uh, decomposers. They're thinner. They're uh, also banded, but not as, uh, not as much variety of color. And the underside is perfectly smooth. There are neither gills nor pores on the bottom of these. Again, they're, they're very common in the woods, and uh, if you go out at all, I'm sure you'll see both of these types of turkey tails. Then there are oyster mushrooms, and these are the same ones that you buy in the store, but they are a wild species. And up until a few years ago, they were very, very common in our woods. Curiously, the last five years or so, they've become a lot harder to find, and it's unclear why. Uh, some of us suspect it may be global warming, but at any rate, they used to find them almost year-round, and now uh, it's a real treat when we run across a cluster like this. Uh, of course, they are cultivated, and uh, so you can get them in the stores. But uh, when you can get them for free in the woods, of course, it's a real treat. Now, this is an example of a mushroom that grows in the dark. It's known as the jack o' lantern mushroom uh, for that reason and also because of the color that is pumpkin colored. Uh, this mushroom uh, grows uh, in a couple of different forms. This is growing here out of the side of the tree. Uh, they're beautiful mushrooms but they are toxic. And uh, sometimes you will find them growing near the base of the tree and you can see the uh, stalks there. And the stalks all come from a common point, uh, which helps to distinguish them from some other edible mushrooms that are the same color. This is uh, an edible mushroom. Uh, the 
name hepatica refers to liver because of the shape and somewhat the color. Uh, common name is the beef steak mushroom. Uh, it has very unusual uh, structure underneath the cap. Uh, it doesn't have normal pores. It has what looks like a compacted soda straw. So each, each little pore, if you will, it has a separate uh, wall. They're not connected to one another. Uh, that's very uncommon. Uh, this is one of the few mushrooms in the wild that you can eat raw. And the curious thing is, it's rather sour. It's an unexpected taste, perhaps, if you're used to ordinary grocery store mushrooms. Another uh, polypore is known as the artist fungus. Uh, it too is very common and it often grows way up uh, the sides of trees. It's called the artist fungus because the underside is pure white and the pores are very small so that it's possible to either harvest or to uh, draw upon it. And I've actually seen specimens in museums uh, of elaborate carvings that are done on this. Here's another one that glows in the dark. This is a tiny fungus. It's only about a quarter to a half an inch in diameter. So this is an extreme close up. Uh, this is the underside. And you can see the gills here. They're all sort of radiate from a common point, not at the center, but on the side. Uh, What's interesting here is the specific epithet, Cypsicus. Uh, men in the audience probably know the term Cypsic from a Cypsic pencil that you use to stamp bleeding uh, if you cut yourself off shaving. And uh, that's what the word Cypsic means, something that stamps is bleeding. And the American Indians discovered that this fungus has that property. And I can attest to the work because once, when I was collecting mushrooms, I accidentally cut myself, and I happened to have some of these in my basket, so I pressed them against the cut, and indeed, it did help to stop the bleeding. So that's rather useful to know. These uh, are also quite common. You'll find these on just about any mushroom walking paper. Now, this is a very unusual fungus, and another quite small one. Uh, again, there's probably only about a quarter inch Paul, uh, but the mycelium, the microscopic thread from which the fruiting bodies have emerged, staining the wood through which they grow blue. And this blue wood is prized by woodworkers who use it for inlay work. Uh, again, this is quite common, although seeing the fruiting bodies, uh, often you just see the stained wood and you don't see the fruiting bodies. So this is a shot that's taken through a practicing uh, microscope. Well, okay, let's go on to the pathogenic fungi. So here's one that is a really serious parasite of oak trees. And unfortunately, uh, here in York, I have seen uh, some beautiful trees that were girdled by these. And it's really a, a death sentence, not only to the tree it's growing on, but if there are other trees in the same species nearby, the spores may travel to them and then it will kill them as well. So here's an example of what it looks like when it's burning the base of the tree. Uh, if that happens to a tree of yours, the best thing to do is to cut the tree down right away to keep the uh, fungus from growing anymore and spreading the spores. You've probably also seen these if you have uh, a juniper tree in your yard, uh, often called cedar trees, but they're not really cedars, they're junipers. Uh, this is a gall produced by a rust fungus. And this is what it looks like uh, on the juniper tree when it's dry. But when it rains, those little projecting uh, horns suddenly come to life, and it looks like that. Uh, these horns are very jelly-like, and they're totally composed of spores. And it's said that uh, these 
things can erupt up to 80 times, depending on how many cycles you get, is dry and wet. So every time it's wet, they emerge like this. When it dries up, they shrink back. Um, and they have a uh, dual life because part of their life cycle is spent on the juniper tree, and the other part is spent on apple trees. And my neighbor happens to have an apple tree in the front yard and a juniper tree in the backyard, and that's a perfect setup to get the, the parasites to show up. Uh, if you go out in the spring and you look at May apples, if you just turn over leaves on a number of them, you'll probably find this rust fungus. And they're called rust simply because of the color. So this is very common on the underside of May apple leaves. Now here's one that is a parasite, but is highly valued by those who eat mushrooms. This is known as chicken of the woods. Uh, whether it really tastes like chicken, a lot of people seem to think that almost anything tastes like chicken. Uh, it is a rather tough mushroom. You, you basically cut off the edge, which is softer, especially the yellow part there, uh, and you cook it slowly, but uh, it is a prized edible. And so when you come across one of these, either on the side of the tree or at the base of the tree, uh, that's quite a fine, and uh, anyone that's familiar with edible mushrooms will envy you that fine. This is a related species that often grows from buried wood or stump, so the common name is still chicken of the woods, but it's uh, a little bit different color of orange, and the margin is white instead of yellow, and this one's an even better edible. So uh, a lot of times there will be a complex of species that has the same common name, but then has different uh, uh, scientific names. Now, just to confuse things, this mushroom, which also grows at the base of trees, is called hen of the wood, not to be confused with the other one. Uh, it too has uh, pores on the underside, but you can see the color is quite different, and this one is much softer than the other. It's not woody. Uh, this is another prize find. It's called Hen of the Woods, and not because of taste, but because people thought it looked like a mother hen with the feathers ruffled uh, sitting on a clutch of eggs. And then another very common and unfortunately a very serious parasite is the honey mushroom. Uh, it's a very variable looking species. Uh, a lot of people hunt this mushroom to eat, especially if they're of the Slavic heritage. They're known as potentes and they're highly prized. But they're not a beginner's mushroom. They are tricky to identify because depending on whether it's wet or dry, their appearance can change quite a bit. And it is a very serious parasite of oak trees. Here's another shot of the same mushroom. Uh, this now from the top showing a sort of uh, model or stipple, as you say, uh, center there. Uh, some of them, some species have a ring, some don't, but uh, both are, are edible. But again, uh, this is one that takes some experience to identify properly. A very unusual mushroom that has neither a bill nor pores, but rather Icicle like teeth on which the spores are born is this <clears throat> mushroom that looks like a soft, a hairy softball, and it's about the size of a softball or even bigger. Uh, uh, I think there are some common names for this. Uh, I think maybe lion's head is one that sometimes is used. Uh, it's a choice edible, but it's not that common. So when you find one, uh, you should. It. Uh, it has a rather mild taste, uh, but it is highly prized. And then to show you one that's totally different, this is a parasite not of a plant, but of a moth pupa. And these uh, little bright orange uh, mushrooms protrude from the soil 
they have a sandpapery surface that you can see. If you dig down carefully, you will find that they're not going out of the soil, they're going out of this moss pupa. They completely colonize that pupa. If you were to cut that open, you would see no internal organs at all. You would see just a white marshmallow mass that looks uh, completely homogeneous. It's all fungus. There's, there's nothing left for the internal organs of the moth. And uh, the relatives of this, uh, the same uh, genus, Portichet, is the source for Portisporum, the drug. Uh, and the related species in Tibet is the basis of the Tibetan economy. Because uh, in Chinese medicine, this is believed to have all kinds of medicinal properties, and they actually sell for more than truffle soup. They're the most expensive mushroom in the world. Here's another uh, moth parasite. It looks quite different. And recently, uh, our club members have been finding these almost every time we go out. And again, this is a change. We didn't used to find these. But now suddenly they seem to be turning up. And I mentioned that you can have one mushroom parasitizing another. Here's an example. The one that looks sort of like a brown golf ball uh, is what's called an earth ball, not to be confused with a puff ball, which I'll show you later. Uh, it's being parasitized by this uh, mushroom on the right side. Uh, which is called a bowling, it's another type of uh, poor mushroom. But on the other hand, that bowling is being parasitized by a mold. So here we have one mushroom and a parasite and a hyperparasite, all in one shot. Okay, let's move on to the mycorrhizal fungi. Perhaps uh, the most commonly illustrated mushroom is this one. Sometimes called the fly mushroom because the claim is that uh, you could make a decoction of this that uh, serves as a fly poison. Uh, it is toxic, it's not fatally so, but uh, it creates uh, some pretty nasty stomach uh, upset. Uh, it is also hallucinogenic, but uh, even those who are interested in such things don't usually eat this because of the uh, stomach. In our area, this mushroom is more often yellow than red. It has color variants uh, depending on which part of the country you live in. So uh, this one actually was taken here in one of our state parks, but it's quite unusual that it was red. So uh, the more common version is a yellow oil. Here's one, uh, yet another amanita, uh, that has two rings on the stalk and has a very bulbous, almost turnip-like root to it. Uh, so there are many, many species in this genus amanita. And since it contains the really deadly mushrooms, most of them, uh, you really shouldn't eat any amanita, even though there are some that are excellent edibles. Uh, I think it is just simply taking too much of a risk. But they are lovely mushrooms and they have many interesting visual characteristics. Okay, uh, further north in the state of Pennsylvania, they have a species called Solidus edulis, or the king bully, which is one of the most highly prized of all edible mushrooms. Unfortunately, it doesn't come down in these southern counties, but we have this lookalike. And it really does look very similar to the other one. Uh, however, this one is extremely bitter. Unless you happen to be among the 1% of people who lack the gene for tasting it as bitter, in which case it is actually edible. This is a common woodland mushroom that I put in here just because it's so colorful. Uh, there are many, many species in this genus Cortinaria. Uh, some are toxic, others are not. There are very few that are edible. Uh, so this is one to just enjoy for its beauty. 
Then another really prized edible are the chanterelles. This is the so-called yellow chanterelle. This is not my photo. This is a photo by one of our other club members. Uh, these are quite common in the summer, usually late July or August. Uh, some of our state parks uh, will have a lot of these. Uh, they are highly prized and highly sought after. Uh, they have been mistaken for that jack-o'-lantern mushroom, and they really shouldn't be. Although they are somewhat the same color, uh, they're a different shape. They have this wavy sort of funnel like top. Uh, they're much smaller. These are maybe two or three inches high at, at most. Uh, and uh, although sometimes they will grow in a cluster like this, usually the stalks don't all come from a common point. They're scattered uh, about in the wood. And uh, they don't grow uh, from wood, they grow on the uh, leaf layer. So this is one to look for. Uh, it's very good and pretty, pretty safe edible species. All right, uh, let me go back and for some reason I'm not seeing. All right, there we go. Uh, this is also a chanterelle. This is what's called a black chanterelle. And uh, I think it's even better than the other chanterelle. Uh, it's a different genus. This is craterellus rather than uh, uh, cantharellus. But uh, these are very hard to spot easily. Now, this one's in moss where it shows up well. But if they're against a uh, brown background, they are brownish gray in color. They're very, very thin. Uh, they're smooth on the outside. Uh, they have a wonderful, fairly strong flavor. And uh, again, they are highly sought after, but not easy to see. This is an example of a blue mushroom. There aren't very many of these. Uh, and this is another one that has just recently moved into our area. The first one I ever saw, I got a call from a fellow uh, that said he had uh, blue mushrooms growing in his mold. And I thought that was very unusual, so I went over to see it, and I was able to identify it very quickly, but I said it, it shouldn't be growing here because that mushroom normally grows down in Georgia in the southeast. And he went and uh, looked at the bag that the mulch had come in, and sure enough, it was from a Georgia pulp mill. And I said to him, well, uh, it probably won't survive the season here. But then within the last uh, five years or so, suddenly this has been showing up in our state park. And again, I think it's the uh, global warming that's probably responsible for it. It is edible, though I wouldn't say it's uh, anything really special. And the odd thing is, when you cook it, instead of that blue, it turns a Kelly green. This is an example of a group of mushrooms called Rushulas. There are many, many species of them. They pretty much all look like this, except for the color. There are red ones, yellow ones, green ones, uh, just about every color of the rainbows. They're very common in the late summer and early fall. Uh, they're generally not edible. Uh, again, they're just something to enjoy the color on the far floor. So let's move on uh, out of the woods and into the flower bed. I suspect that many of you, if you have mulch in your flower bed, will have these bird's nest functions. There are two common species. They're both quite small. These are about, uh, I would say, a quarter inch in diameter. And they start out with a membrane that covers the top. So you can see some of these that appear to just have a, a sort of a cream colored smooth top. Uh, as they mature, that ruptures and exposes these things that look like eggs in a nest. And uh, they're not eggs, but they actually are spore cases. So they contain the spores of this fungus. And they're not distributed by wind like most mushroom spores are, but rather they wait until the cup is hit by a raindrop. 
the raindrop knocks these into the air, and underneath each one of these little things that looks like an egg is a coiled tendril, which extends and it has a sticky pad on the end. And as it flies through the air, if it's lucky, that pad it contacts the plant, which sticks to the plant, and the forecase hangs down and gradually disintegrates and drops the spores on the ground underneath. So the spore dispersal is by raindrop, and that's a very unusual uh, mechanism. Very few mushrooms do that. Uh, this is a close-up of that species. You can see how uh, hairy it is on the outside, and the uh, name Triatus refers to the striping on the interior. The other common species is this one. Uh, the generic name here refers to its crucible shape. Uh, you can tell it at a glance because of the color. In this case, uh, the eggs are uh, yellow or, or almost white and uh, is in contrast to the gray on the other species. But here again, you can see the membrane that covers them initially, and then you can see what it looks like once that membrane has ruptured and disappeared. Another one that is very hard to see because they are so tiny, uh, but has been a real problem for people in the past, is this so-called cannon funk. This is really minute. I would say it's no more than a couple of millimeters in diameter. And it used to be quite common on mulch. The problem is that this fungus ejects its spores in little packets, little black tar spot packets. And if your house is nearby or you have a car nearby, these will adhere to your house or your car, and they're almost impossible to remove. So Pennsylvania Body Shops used to sell a lot of money from these uh, because they were uh, they were so hard to remove. Nowadays, uh, that's a lot less common because it's been found that they only grow on certain kinds of mulch. And so most people now have mulch that this species doesn't grow on. I wanted to show you a close up of this. This is taken through a microscope showing how, how it grows. So this, this really shows all the stages from one that's completely closed to one that's just starting to open here in the foreground. Then if you go to the upper left, you can see this ball starting to form in this cup. And eventually that cup turns itself inside out and flings this uh, ball into the air uh, with tremendous force. And it can actually fly several feet in the air. So it's a pretty spectacular uh, job that it does. Uh, Distributing the spores. You've probably also seen some of these in your flower beds. Uh, they smell terrible. Uh, and there's a reason they smell terrible because they're trying to attract flies. It's this uh, sort of green slime at the top that smells bad. And flies come to it thinking they found some carrion or. Uh, or maybe some uh, species, and they're going to uh, alight on it. Well, uh, they're disappointed. It's not what they're expecting, but they carry away the spores on their legs. And so this is an example of a fungus that whose spores are distributed by insects. There are a number of species of these, different colors. There's a different species. Again, very common. Uh, one summer I saw a parking lot on one of our local banks is just absolutely covered with these things. Now, you may also notice something in your garden that's actually not a mushroom, it's a slime mold, which is another type of organism that's uh, studied by mycologists. Uh, these things are harmless. They basically are grazing on bacteria, but they are capable of flowing, sort of like amoebas. And so they they will flow from one place to another. They'll cover almost anything that gets in their path. 
again, they, they don't harm it. Uh, they just merely graze on bacteria. And then when things dry up, they also uh, dry up and go into a spore producing stage. And so in, as a later stage, they're no longer uh, the color they were. And uh, if you were to break these open, I think you'd find a kind of gray band inside. Uh, because they're such amorphous looking things, some people uh, get worried about these and think that uh, some sort of horrible blob is taking, taking over. They very much like moisture. So the one thing you don't want to do is try to get rid of them by spraying them with a hose. Because if you do that, they will just immediately multiply and your entire garden will be full of Another one that you often see in mulch are these mushrooms called lepiotas. They're actually fairly closely related to the amanitas we saw earlier, and some of them are dangerous. But uh, they're lovely. They often grow in clusters like this, uh, with this triple pop. Uh, and again, there are, are many species of these. But they're, they're quite common uh, under some uh, evergreens, for example, and uh, in various kinds of mulch. Well, what about lawn? Okay, this one I want to mention especially because it's a very dangerous species. Uh, chlorophyllum means green gill. And when these first come up, they look like this. They're, they're large mushrooms, uh, so they're fairly tall. Uh, these things are maybe two inches in diameter, even in this initial stage. And then the cap opens up and they become really large. These can be dinner plate size and they have these spectacular brown scales on the top. And uh, I guess it's just because they look so uh, tempting that some people eat them. Uh, if you do, it won't kill you, but it will give you a gastric experience that you won't forget. And in fact, they send more people to the hospital than any other wild mushroom because the uh, vomiting and diarrhea that is so severe, it's, it's almost like having cholera. And you have to be taken to the emergency room and put on IV fluid to get your fluid balance under control. So uh, this is one of the few lawn mushrooms that's really dangerous. And especially uh, if you have kids that might nibble on mushrooms. Uh, this is one to really be aware of. It comes up in the main part of summer, in the hottest days of summer, you'll find this very common in lawns in this area. And in its really young stages, some people confuse it with this mushroom, which is a good edible mushroom. Uh, I like the nickname for this, lawyer's wig. Uh, this mushroom, uh, will open up into sort of a bell shape, but not flat like the one we just saw. And also, this one, as it grows, turns black and liquefies. And it turns out uh, the spores are in that, that black liquid. And so it liquefies from the edge of the cap to the center. Uh, in this early stage, these are uh, considered choice edible. I don't find them too often here, but up in State College, I've seen uh, front yards just full of it. So it depends a little bit on exactly where you are, whether you'll find this mushroom or not. This is the later stage of it with the sort of bell shape. You can see it does have a ring on the stalk, and you can see that it is starting to turn black uh, from the edge upward. And it is scaly, as you can see. Another one in the same genus, uh, this is a decomposer of stump, but it's also a good edible. It's called the mica cap because uh, when it's young, it has little crystals on it that look sort of like salt crystals or mica crystals. Uh, they too turn black as they age and often make the stump look like it's burned. Uh, they're a good edible, but you don't usually find that many of them, so it's hard to make a meal of them. They have a kind of a nutty flavor. Uh, here's a, another shot of a, some younger specimens, and I think if you look closely, you can see a little bit of the granular uh, crystals that are adhering to the surface there before they rain washes them away. 
Many of you will probably have seen these in your yard. Certainly, we've had them come up in our yard, and a number of our neighbors have. This is a giant puffball, and these are perhaps the safest of all wild mushrooms to eat because there's just nothing else that big that looks like them. Uh, these uh, are at least softball size, if not bigger. Some other species, which are pure white, can be basketball size or, or even larger. Uh, if you cut these open, they look like a marshmallow inside, just a pure white. Now, as they age, they turn yellow and get bitter. But if they're fresh, they're just pure white on the inside. And you can slice these and cook them like fresh toast or like tofu. They're, they're very mild flavored and uh, I think more similar to tofu than anything else I can think of. So there are a number of species of these giant puff balls. Uh, and they're called puff balls because eventually a pore develops uh, in the center and they, any uh, pressure or even a gust of wind will uh, cause the spores to puff out through that pore. More common are these smaller puff balls. Uh, so this is uh, a very common one. Uh, <laughs> It was named, uh, the, the genus was named by Linnaeus, a uh, lycoprudy, which means wolf part. And apparently, uh, he was referring to the sound of the spores exiting the, uh, the pore. A uh, pretty fanciful name. But at any rate, uh, it's a very common puzzle. These are also edible, but of course, it takes quite a few to make a meal. Uh, this is a lawn mushroom that is not common, uh, Canosby phalaris. It's another one of these dangerous little brown mushrooms. Uh, again, there are many little brown mushrooms. They tend to be rather nondescript and hard to distinguish from one another. This one actually has the same toxin as those amanita. Uh, fortunately, uh, it's inconspicuous, so it's not collected that often. But uh, it would be a danger, again, to children, possibly even to dogs. There are some canine fatalities every year due to dogs eating some of the amanita mushrooms and possibly from eating these as well. Well, spring is hopefully on our way, although uh, one wonders with the recent snow. But anyway, looking ahead to spring, many of you know about morel. There's more than one species. The earliest ones uh, are known as black morels. Uh, they tend to be more elongated and uh, darker in color. And morels are characterized by this pitted surface. And I say pitted rather than convoluted, like a brain, uh, because there are also false morels, which have a convoluted surface. So the spores are born inside the cavity on that surface. Morels, of course, are highly prized edibles. They are really hard to see among the leaf litter. So one of the reasons I think they're surprised is simply that it's so hard to find them. Uh, and they have a very brief fruiting period, usually from the middle of April to the middle of May. And that's just about it. Uh, so every spring, uh, mushroom hunters go out with great hope. If it happens to be a good year, it's wonderful. But an awful lot of the time, it's very frustrating. You look for them and you only find a handful. Here's another uh, species. This is the so-called yellow morel. Uh, it's not quite as tall as the others. It blends in with the leaves also very well. Uh, and I find morels primarily under two poplar trees in this area. Some people claim that they find them under ash trees, but unfortunately the ash borders are eliminating a lot of our ash trees. Uh, I've been told that they can also be found under uh, uh, hickory and uh, maybe beech, but nearly all of them I found are under two poplar. So that's where I would go. Uh, so looking for it. 
Now, this is an example of a false morale. Notice the difference. It's not pitted. It is convoluted like a brain. And this is a dangerous mushroom. Uh, it's actually been sold in markets uh, in earlier years and it's still sold in markets in Europe, especially in Finland. But the problem is that this mushroom contains a cumulative toxin. So you can eat it a few times, and I guess it tastes very good, and uh, you don't have a problem. But this toxin is gradually building up in your system. And different uh, specimens contain different amounts of this toxin. And uh, eventually, you will reach a certain threshold. And if you go past that threshold, it will kill you. So false morale should definitely not be eaten. Uh, I guess in Finland they they boil them or something that they claim you get rid of the toxin. But I don't quite understand why you go to all that trouble. And I can't imagine how much taste you'd have left after you did. So be sure you know the difference between a true morale and a false morale. Another mushroom that comes up at the same time as the morale are these spectacular mushrooms that grow on the sides of trees. These are quite large, they're six to eight inches uh, in diameter, I'd say. Some, some even bigger than that. Uh, common name is pheasant sack, uh, because of the sort of feather-like pattern. Uh, it is edible. Uh, they tend to be rather tough and they require slow cooking. And I don't care for the taste. It's quite a strong taste. Oddly enough, if you cut one, they smell like watermelon. But they don't taste like watermelon. And to me, they taste more like liver than they did like watermelon. So there are people who like them, but uh, it's very much a matter of personal taste. They're certainly plentiful. So if you can't find morels and you like these, you should be able to have quite a few meals because they, they really grow on a lot of trees in that early spring. So next time you go out in the woods or just in your yard, I suggest you pay more attention to fungi and the roles they play. Uh, and even if that's not your primary issue, this hunting for them can make you see a lot more aspects of the natural world. If you do become fascinated with them, as many people do, and especially if you're interested in collecting them for the table, joining the club is definitely the quickest way to learn about them and in particular to learn to identify. Uh, we're lucky here in Pennsylvania because in our state park, state forests and game lands, you can collect mushrooms without a permit. Uh, as long as you're, there's no more than 10 people in the group, and you can collect them just like you can collect nuts and berries in reasonable quantities for your personal use. Uh, every other state that surrounds Pennsylvania, you have to get a permit, uh, except Delaware, where you cannot get a permit even for a scientific collection. And why that is the case, I, I really have no idea. That seems crazy to me. If you want further information, uh, first of all, there's this book that came out in 2012 from Princeton University Press. It's a sort of a coffee table sized book with gorgeous illustrations, but also very up to date information. Very informative text that really introduces you to the wide variety of organisms we call fungi. And uh, if you haven't already seen it, there is a film that came out in 2019 in our local uh, art house movie theater here in York. This had the longest run of any film they've had. It has tremendous uh, time lapse photography of mushrooms growing. And it really just gives you a lot of information about the potential that fungi has for saving our planet by cleaning it up in, uh, in a lot of ways. And you might also want to visit the website of our local mushroom club, the Eastern Penn Mushroomer. Uh, and so I've given the uh, URL for that here on this page. Well, that's the uh, end of my slideshow. Uh, so I will stop the sharing and open it to questions at this point. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, so we did have quite a few questions come through so far. 
um, one of them, one of them was um, from Charlotte. She was just letting everyone know about the mushroom festival that's in Kennett Square. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So she just wanted to let everyone know about that. Um, but Molly asked, Molly had to leave. Um, so I told her I would email her your answer to her question. Um, she asked, why are the turkey tail more colorful when they're wet? Uh, I don't know chemically uh, what's going on with that, but uh, uh, presumably it's some sort of uh, reaction that just enhances the uh, uh, pigments that are in the mushroom, uh, but it is quite noticeable. They, they really are a lot brighter colors uh, when they're wet, uh, but okay. I, I don't know even whether the chemists really have explored that. That is quite a good question. Okay. All right. Um, Karen asked if anyone was to send you photos of mushrooms, if you would be willing to try to identify them. I would be willing to try, but I'll tell you, uh, photographs are really not very easy to take of mushrooms when you're interested in identifying. Uh, mushroom, photos of mushrooms can be beautiful, but the problem is that to identify mushrooms, you need to see not just the top, but the top, the bottom, the stalk, the base of the stalk, the top of the stalk where the uh, forebearing surface meets it. Uh, there's so many separate things that you have to check. So unlike birds, where there's just a few uh, key features that can pretty well tell you what it is, uh, with mushrooms, it's a lot more uh, difficult process, and most photos don't show you enough. Now, of course, some species are very common, and those those I could easily identify. Uh, but if you do send mushrooms, make sure you do get a picture of the top and the bottom, and if you can, of several stages: the young ones, the button stage, up to the the others. You have a much better chance then. And that's a problem with field guides also. A lot of people will buy a field guide and try to identify mushrooms just from the pictures. But a good field guide will not just have pictures, but will have written descriptions, and in particular has keys, uh, numbered choices that allow you to go through a procedure systematically and eliminate things one by one until you finally zero in on what it is. And okay. there are so many mushrooms that's important. No, no guidebook can have all of them because they're just so many species. Right. Okay. Well, that's good to know. All right. Um, Mary asked for the mushrooms that glow in the dark. Do you need a UV light or do they glow at night? They glow at night. Uh, you don't need a special light at all. Uh, it is technically luminescent rather than fluorescent. So things that require UV light are fluorescent. But these are like lightning bugs. You can, they're not as bright as lightning bugs. Uh, and it does depend a little bit just on environmental conditions. Sometimes uh, they're pretty faint, and other times they're much brighter. Uh, I have collected some of the jack lantern mushrooms on a mushroom foray with members of our club, and it was a dark night. We just turned out all the lights. And it takes your eyes a little while to accommodate, maybe a minute. But then you will see this blue green glow. And if you keep looking and your eyes adjust more, you will actually see the pattern of the gills in blue green. Oh, wow. Uh, most of them do seem to be blue green, the ones I see. And just very recently, there was a set of stamps, US stamps that came out of bioluminescent organs. And one of them did feature a mushroom. Oh, wow. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, so there's another question. Are a fungi that parasitize moth pupae considered carnivores? Uh, yes, I suppose you'd have to say they are because they are digesting the uh, tissues of that organism. Uh, some of them are very insidious. Uh, the first ones that were ever discovered were down in the Caribbean and they were ants. It had what looked like mushrooms growing out of their head. And they developed, these ants 
and and some of caterpillars, I think, as well, develop what's called stomach disease, which means that the mushroom has a psychotropic chemical that affects the brain of the animal and causes it to climb to the highest point. And at that point, the mushroom erupts and distributes its spores. And the high point means that spores travel as far as possible. So it actually reduces the host organism to help it display its distributed spores. And there are some, I've, I've not seen these, but there's another species that attacks the tubing. It's even more insidious. Uh, it causes the bottom half of the cicada to drop off. But the cicada, which has come out, of course, cicadas come out only briefly, basically to mate, and then they, then they die. Uh, the cicada still has the urge to mate. And it doesn't actually have any reproductive organs left. The, the fungus has killed them. But it will seek out a mate and spread, in attempting to populate with a mate, it will spread the spores to yet another one. So they're not distributed by the wind, but it's, it's actually a very disease of cicadas of all things. That's a fungal disease. And uh, mushroom parasites can really be nasty things. It sounds like it. Wow. Um. So then, the when it comes to the colors of mushrooms, um, the color variations are they affected by the type of soil that they're growing in? They're affected by the type of soil. They're affected by uh, how much moisture there is. Uh, they vary with age, uh, even in a given location and with constant other conditions. Uh, so except for the color of the spores, they're very variable. But the spores uh, have, that's why the primary identification feature is that they remain the same color uh, throughout. Okay. Um, so this is kind of back to the, the fungus on the moth, um, on the pupa. If it would land on like a tree or a plant instead of that moth pupa, would it would the spores still survive or would it die off because it doesn't have anything to to it, feed? It would, it would die off, yes. Okay. Uh, in general, fungi produce tremendous numbers of spores because the probability that they will land in an appropriate substrate is really quite small. Uh, one of the most prolific spore producers is the oyster mushroom. Uh, if you go up to the main campus of one state, they have a mushroom research center there that engages in uh, research on commercial mushroom growing. And one of the species they study is the oyster mushroom. They have their oyster mushrooms in a separate, hermetically sealed room, and you can look through the glass, and it's absolutely murky inside. You have to wear a respirator if you go in this room because a single one of these uh, oyster mushrooms may produce a trillion spores. So you can imagine how many a cluster <laughs> produces. Uh, and they have to have this kind of overkill just to make sure that enough land in appropriate places that they can then germinate and grow. Um, someone commented and said that they have seen squirrels eating mushrooms in their yard. Um, are there other wildlife that will also eat mushrooms besides squirrels? Oh, yes. Uh, well, as I mentioned, the uh, voles, these little mouse-like animals that tend to live underground a lot, uh, they eat truffles. Uh, slugs often nibble on mushrooms. And it's important to understand that if you see a mushroom that has been nibbled, that doesn't mean it's edible. Because you don't know what nibbles it. Its digestive system might be very different from ours. And you don't know what happens to the animal that did nibble it. Did it wander off and die? Or uh, did it have a good meal? But there are, there certainly are animals. I think squirrels is one example. I believe it's true that squirrels can actually eat the deadly ammonite. Uh, oh. Most animals cannot, but there are some whose stomach uh, 
just don't operate the same way, and they apparently are able to detoxify the Okay. Uh, I see one the question that just came on the screen about breathing spores. Uh, do you have to, to worry about that? Normally, outdoors, it wouldn't be a problem. But if you are in a confined space and you have, you know, a particularly prolific spore pollution, it, it could be. Uh, there is one dye mushroom that you have to be careful not to uh, hover over the dye pot and inhale the, the fumes because uh, they can be toxic. So, yeah, in, in large concentrations, certainly it wouldn't be that healthy to inhale spores. Okay. What makes certain mushrooms grow under certain trees, like the morels and the tulip trees? That's something that's uh, very much a subject of research these days. Uh, the more they found out about how vital fungi are to tree growth, what they know is that most mushrooms do have specific hosts that they associate with, not just the parasitic ones, but the, the ones that have this mutual mycorrhizal relationship. Uh, there tend to be specific species of mushrooms that, that go with specific trees. Now, many trees will have more than one mycorrhizal partner. Uh, presumably, uh, it's a chemical thing uh, that allows them to identify each other. Uh, I, I don't know that they really know exactly which chemicals or which genetic principles are involved, but they have evolved over the eons uh, to develop these associations. Uh, and yeah, it's very interesting, the specificity of this. There are also specificities in other ways. For example, there's one really unusual group of mushrooms, or a fungi, I should say, because they don't produce big food and ice, that uh, grow an insect, but they're not serious parasites in the sense that they don't kill the insect. Uh, they just sort of hitch a ride, and they do get, I guess, some nutrients. They may sip a little of the insect's blood, but not enough to kill it. Uh, anyway, uh, they're, they're not often seen because they're so very small. But if you go out and you find a ladybug beetle, you might look at it closely and see that it has little translucent uh, blobs floating on the uh, edges of its wings. Uh, okay. These are famous for being not just host specific, but site specific. So there are some of them that will only, let's say, grow on the right knee of a certain species of bug. Uh, and there's one species, I think that the ladybug, it depends on whether it's a female bug or a male bug, where the fungus grows. If it's a female, they'll grow on the back. If it's a male, they'll grow on the underside. And the idea is that when the insects mate, so do the fungi. They come in contact in that way. So uh, it is uh, it is very interesting. Now, not all fungi are sexual. Some of them are asexual and and just uh, like yeast, just reproduce by budding. But uh, in most of the common mushroom uh, fungi that produce mushrooms, uh, it is sexual reproduction. And some of them also have more than one form. So, for example, on the uh, the the uh, Pupa parasite that I've showed, that is the sexual form, but there is also an asexual form, and it's that form from which the cyclic form is derived. And it can be very confusing. In fact, until scientists realized that we could have two forms of the same thing, they would find these, they always resemble one another, they'd get different scientific names, and then only much later would they realize they're just two forms of the same thing. So from a taxonomic standpoint, it's really a mess. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it might be. Um, so can human harvesting jeopardize the mushroom species populations at all? 
uh, if it was done on a really large scale, uh, perhaps, but since you're just picking the fruit, it's sort of like harvesting apples. As long as you don't kill a tree, you're not going to stop the apple to death. Uh, unless you harvest so many that there are never any seeds that get distributed. I mean, there's never any windfalls in that. Uh, it's unlikely that you could harvest so many mushrooms that there wouldn't be spores that still produce. Uh, but if you dig up in the soil around the mushrooms, you just don't collect the mushroom, but you collect some of the mycelia. That's a more serious problem. And what's really a problem is simply uh, development, building housing development, and things like that over woodland or, or pasture. Uh, it's really that of destruction of habitat that is the biggest threat. But uh, yeah, picking, uh, commercial mushroom picking uh, in some of the national forests is restricted because uh, they just pick everything they can find and uh, it just, you know, uh, it doesn't keep the mushrooms from fruiting, but it keeps other people from even seeing them. And so uh, it, it can be a problem if they're over harvested or not. Okay. Um, so someone asked um, if your wife might share her dyeing processes and species that she uses for her yarn. Uh, yes. They're very interested. Yes, uh, there's actually uh, one or two books on the subject. Uh, one of them is called The Rainbow Beneath My Feet. Uh, and it's sort of... Uh, it's by a woman named Arlene Bessette, uh, who's a very well-known uh, mycologist. There are a number of species. Interestingly, most of the ones that are good dye mushrooms are not edible mushrooms, so there's not much overlap. Uh, and many of the dye mushrooms are very nondescript, inconspicuous things. They're not very colorful. Uh, many of them have teeth on the underside of the cap instead of spores or uh, uh, gills. And so, uh, yeah, my wife's very interested. She would be happy to uh, give, give the names of some of the species she works with. Uh, the colors also depend not just on the species, but on the particular mordant that's used with them. And for those not familiar with dye, a mordant is a chemical that's used to set the dye. Uh, to make them uh, adhere to the fibers. And depending on what mordant you use, the colors can change radically. So it's a combination of the two. And uh, my wife has given a demonstration of this uh, a number of places. There used to be, uh, until just the last couple of years, uh, this wonderful uh, uh, fiber uh, place in uh, just outside East Berlin called the Manning, that was a mecca for weavers and spinners and uh, knitters. Uh, unfortunately, it has, uh, the owners have retired and it's no longer in business. But uh, every spring they would have, or spring or summer, they would have uh, a day in which they featured various things and mushroom dyeing is one thing that has been done. But uh, yeah, if someone wants to uh, contact her, uh, you, uh, you could do that. Uh, the easiest way to do it would just be to, uh, I'll give you the uh, uh, URL for her forwarding email. That way if her, her address changes, it'll still get to it. So it's Cheryl, spelled with a C, C-H-E-R-Y-L underscore Dawson at alum dot M-I-T dot edu and that's that's the mit forwarding site so she can be reached that way and i can be reached the same way just with john and Sister Cheryl. uh so uh if they have specific questions about the guy she could uh, help answer them. okay all right thank you hopefully when uh, this pandemic is over with she'll be able to give demonstrations again <laughs> yeah that would be wonderful that would be really <laughs> interesting yeah, that's a little hard to do virtually because you gotta have these pots and you gotta walk around. Yeah. 
Uh, so we had, we'll do at least one more. I know it's almost 8.30. Um, what's your favorite edible mushroom? Ah, I think the uh, black trumpet are my favorite. The, the black shadow. Uh, they're good in a lot of dishes, and uh, I tend to like the fairly strong flavored things. So, for example, I I actually don't care that much for morels. I think most of the recipes for them have so much uh, cream and butter and uh, other things like that that it kind of masks the mushroom flavors. Uh, I think morels can be really good in a risotto and in, in certain other simple dishes, but uh, a lot of recipes I've seen from, in particular with uh, red meat, I think the red meat would really overpower the mushroom. Whereas uh, the black shadows are not likely to get overpowered. They, I, I can't really describe their flavor, but it is really delicious. Uh, and uh, they're like morels, they're a little tricky to, uh, to spot, but once you uh, know what to look for, uh, I look forward every summer to trying to get some more of those. And the nice thing is, uh, you can uh, preserve them. I, I should say that uh, different mushrooms vary in how best to preserve them. So uh, morels you can dry, and the black trumpets you can dry very successfully. Uh, but don't do that with yellow chanterelles. If you dry yellow chanterelles, they really lose a lot of flavor. So the best way to fix them is to just saute them lightly uh, in butter or oil and then uh, freeze them for the later use because uh, drying uh, really does pretty much destroy the flavor. Okay, that's good information. I'll have to add those to my list of mushrooms to try. <laughs> oh yeah, there. Uh, there are you know some others. There's, there's one that comes up in the fall that's very good. They're called bluets and they are sort of a uh, purplish color I didn't have a picture of them, and the reason is that uh, they're not a beginner's mushroom. Uh, there are a number of other mushrooms that look like them, and it can be a little tricky to identify them. Uh, and they come up in the, pretty much in the late fall, so it's kind of an unusual time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, John, um, for doing this lecture tonight. Um, anyway, I know a couple people had commented and said that they were having trouble hearing or, or seeing at some point. Um, so if anyone would like a recording, I was recording this tonight. Um, John gave me permission. If you would like a recording, I can send that over to you. You just um, reply to the email that you received the link from, and I will send that to you tomorrow. Um, but again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and for all of our lectures this year. Um, we hope that you maybe become a friend of Wildwood or even donate to the park to help support this program as well as so many other things that we do for everyone out there. Thank you again and we'll hopefully see you soon. Have a good evening. Thank you, John. Oh, and there was one more thing if you're still on here. I just remembered this. We are going to be posting links um, up for all of our lectures at some point next month um, on Facebook. So if you don't already, you can follow Dolphin County Parks and Recreation, um, and we'll be posting all of the links to the lectures. All of them were recorded, so you'll be able to watch them whenever you would like. Thank you.